The hum of multitudes was there, but multitudes of lambs, thousands of little boys and girls raising their innocent hands. Welcome to the Troubadour Podcast. Today we will be reading Holy Thursday from Songs of Innocence by William Blake. And on this episode, I'll also be reading the Holy Thursday in Songs of Experience. Now, if you've been following along, if not, that's okay. But I've been reading all the poems in the Songs of Innocence every Sunday, one at once uh, song or poem each week. And one of my purposes is if you do choose to follow along, or at least to some degree, what I hope you'll gain is an an overall understanding of individual poems. Let me repeat that. An overall understanding of individual poems. An overarching understanding of the poems that fit together individually. And the reason I'm stressing that is because there is a very important sense in which it is absolutely critical to read great books of poetry like this as a book. Because William Blake, a great artist, meant it to be read as a book, not as a separated black text on white background floating in space like I'm going to be doing today, text that you're just reading one poem separated from the totality. Reading Holy Thursday by itself is a good poem. Reading Holy Thursday as a part of the Songs of Innocence and Experience is life-altering. And that's part of what I'm trying to convey with these readings. Now, just to give you an idea, let me show you um, an image of how this looks in the Songs of Innocence that you would have purchased, in, or Songs of Innocence and Experience, let's say, that you would have purchased in, say, 1798. It was published in 1794, the Songs of Innocence and Experience was published in 1794, a year after the um, reign of terror in France. William Blake is, of course, from Britain, but they are also at war, Britain and France. So this is what it looks like. And um, we're going to talk about what, what it means, why it looks like that, um, and, and, and so on in this poem. But I think it helps you to understand the poem if you understand what it was supposed to look like versus what I'm going to show you and um, what it does in the both the books, Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience. Before I read the poem, the last thing I'll remind you of is that one of the things Blake does in his songs of innocence and experience is he often pairs poems. This is one of the most clearly paired poems in the whole series. There is a Holy Thursday in um, the songs of innocence, and there is a Holy Thursday in the songs of experience. And it's, it bears discussing the comparison that each of them have with one another. And, um, you know, the reason it has that it has a comparison because there's a sense in which there's experience on the outskirts or the, the shading around the, the tinting around the edges of the songs of innocence. So there is a kind of experience there. And then of course, in the songs of experience, it's not tinted in terms of the way that, it, you know, innocence doesn't tint the, um, or shade so the song of experience in this case. But I think there is a feeling that the innocence is there, but it's, something has changed in it, right? Something's different. And, you know, we talk about, for instance, a loss of innocence. Like, that's how we often phrase it. Now, Blake's philosophy is, um, and the way he comes or believes to come to these ideas is what is called the dialectic process. And we're seeing the dialectic process in action with his poems. The dialectic process, if you're unfamiliar with it, essentially is you have a thesis and an antithesis. You know, you're stating some idea, some statement, some thought, some overall uh, project or viewpoint, 
And that's your thesis. And then there's the opposite of that or the antithesis that is going to clash with it. And through the dialectic process, which we can, you know, um, have as an analogy, not a perfect one, but maybe some kind of analogy, like a conversation where they're conversing. One person says one thing, another person brings up an example in the other department. And then hopefully by the end of this dialectic process, maybe this takes one conversation, maybe it takes 10, maybe it takes 10 hundred lifetimes, right? But the, the end of the dialectic process is a synthesis of something new. And maybe there's something new doesn't have to take that long. Maybe it doesn't have to be the final new. Maybe there's an, a thesis and antithesis and then there's one new thing. And then, you know, maybe from there there's a, another thesis, another antithesis and another new thing, right? But that's the general process is thesis, antithesis, new thing or synthesis, a combination. And so in Blake's view, there is a kind of uh, innocence that's an experience and a kind of experience that's an innocence. And there's a you know, no matter what, it's always in you. These two things are in you forever. And in fact, the subtitle of his book, The Songs of Innocence and Experience, is showing the two contrary states of the human soul. Okay, so let us read Holy Thursday together and just experience it for the first time. Again, it's not going to make a ton of sense. The only prefatory mark on the poem I want to make is that Holy Thursday was an event, uh, a big event uh, a, called Ascension Day for St. Paul's, um, St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And you'll see what it's about, but it's a procession of the, chari- the, uh, um, the children, the orphans in London at that time. And it was just a big ceremony that they would do. And I don't want to give too much detail because we'll talk a little bit about it Um, after you experience the poem once. So let's read this poem. Uh, Holy Thursday. Let me pop this up. Okay, so if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can see the text. If not, I, you know, read it. And, you know, if you're on podcasts, I'm on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you listen to podcasts, I'm pretty sure I'm there. So if you're listening and not hearing it, that's fine. Um, You could hop over to Troubadour Pod, uh, Troubadour mag mag.com and you can get a um you know you can get the visuals you could read the poem there or just you know google holy thursday's song of innocence um and and just kind of read along or just listen you know whatever you, so, uh, poems it, this is a song i'm not gonna sing it but this is a song you know it's meant to be heard and the oral the, the kind of that that uh sense is very important to poetry in general but especially to songs of innocence and experience. Okay. uh, Holy Thursday by William Blake. T'was on a holy Thursday, their innocent faces clean, the children walking two and two in red and blue and green. Gray-headed beetles walked before with wands as white as snow till into the high dome of Paul's they like Thames waters flow. Oh, what a multitude they seemed, these flowers of London town. Seated in companies, they sit with radiance all their own. The hum of multitudes was there, but multitudes of lambs, thousands of little boys and girls raising their innocent hands. Now like a mighty wind, they raise to heaven the voice of song, or like harmonious thunderings the seats of heaven among, beneath them sit the aged men, wise guardians of the poor. Then cherish pity, lest you drive an angel from your door. Now, as usual, if that meant very little to you, that's okay. We're going to go through it. Let me give you the visuals again so you can see what it looked like. This is what the Echoing Green, another poem, and um, looks like. So if, again, if you're on TroubadourMag.com or if you're on YouTube or Facebook watching, you can see um, another poem from the Songs of Innocence called The Echoing Green. And in fact, if you look at all the poems in his book, Holy Thursday really stands out just from a visual standpoint. And I don't mean the actual drawing that he did, but I mean next to like Laughing Song and um, a few other ones, which the lines are kind of longer. Um, Holy Thursday has, I think, the longest lines. 
it's and in fact in the book that I have they actually it's so long that it didn't fit on the page straight across it had to go to the next line now that's not in his case in his case in the drawing that he did there is you know he has the whole line but you could see how it has this kind of longness to it and when you read it um twas on a holy thursday their innocent faces clean the children walking two and two in red and blue and green gray-headed beetles walked before with wands as white as snow till into the high dome of paul's they like thames waters flow and he has the the visual the audio the the auditory and even to some degree the you know or, or to a large degree the form and the look it all goes together to kind of emphasize the marching nature of what's going on with these children so you could see this with again if you're looking at the visual of the hand drawn um picture that Blake drew of this poem including the text you could see there's a kind of a marching and they you know it's going one line into the next and they're kind of crammed together and it's you know twas on a holy thursday there and and it's got this do 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 and you know it's got that kind of cadence to it and it feels like a marching song and these kids are being marched and these kids are being um you know and they're they're walking down and this that's what is actually going on so we get this sense of um one the narrator is observing this event and he's saying something that he he saw like it's just some observer it was on a holy thursday their innocent face is clean now i don't think the narrator in this case is william blake i think it is just a casual observer who's you know kind of seeing this procession and he's probably a londoner of some sort seeing the procession now let's read carefully what's actually going on with the words. And let's take things like connotation and denotation very seriously. So first off, we're, you know, twas on a holy Thursday, their innocent faces clean. And I think this is an important um, perspective that he's fo- focusing, his first line, he's focusing on their innocent faces clean. He's talking about innocent, he's talking about faces, and he's talking about clean. And what we get is um i think a sense where we could almost say it feel like they he could add the words or the words could be in our imagination and this is what happened to me is that if you read it, it's like twas on a holy thursday their innocent innocent faces had been cleaned as though they had been dirtied right so we get this sense of these dirty kids who've been cleaned up that's what i think is going on with this first line the children walking two and two in red and blue and green. Now, one of the reasons I think I get that sense is because I've read the other Songs of Innocence, which is why I really stress that. So when you've read The Chimney Sweeper, The Echoing Green, you've really read The Piper and uh, The Little Lamb and The Little Black Boy, you get a sense where there's something, you know, he's trying to say about innocence in a world of experience or in a world that's not doing its job to some degree. So we're, I think we're going to get a little bit more of that where it's like, there actually is a slight critique. So this on the surface, like many of the songs of innocence could seem like just a praise of this beautiful ceremony, but then on this on underneath it, if you really, really pay hard attention and you're, you're focusing on it, you could see that there is a critique of this whole process of, you know, well, we will talk about that as we go through it, but this is the first hint is that, you know, they're, they were dirty. So why were they, why were the faces dirtied and then cleaned? Why, you know, are they cleaned every day? I think the answer would be no, they're not cleaned every day. Their faces are not cleaned every day. These are children who are living and these are orphaned children who are living at the dole of the, the, um, you know, the, um, they're living at the expense of the state or, or charity, I should say. And um, now they're not living in lavish luxury. And, uh, but they also don't have a lot of other things that kids who have families would probably have, right? They're orphans. So now you have these children. Again, these are children walking two and two. So they're walking next to each other with a ward, right? And so one of the issues that you might feel if you're, um, you know, a Christian conservative 
even in this era, although I wouldn't call William Blake a Christian conservative. He was a, <laughs> not at all. He was a visionary uh, of imaginatory imagination of a, a very immense individual who was very pro the baseline Christian ethos, but very anti church and authority and repression and uh, suppression of your own emotions and rep- repressing other people or oppressing other people, I should say. So he was very against that. But I think if you really try to visualize this for a second, you you like you look to the left and you're at this holy Thursday day and you're with your family and you're holding the, you know, your child's hand, right? You have a child, let's say, and you're holding your child's hand. And then you look at all these pe- these kids, this, you know, you see like a little five-year-old, a little eight-year-old, a little nine-year-old, a little ten-year-old, a little you know, so this is a common sight that happened every year. And so you're looking around and you see all these kids and it's like, oh, look, we're doing such a good job. Like that's the the basic idea of the poem. But then you have to say like, well, why are those kids like that? Like w- what's going on in our society where it's like, here's a kid who has parents, he's getting fed every day, his face is always clean. And there's these kids, he, or, or you know, mostly clean, there's probably a little like getting dirty is kind of cute, but he has a mother to kind of like, you know, lick her thumb and scrub the the smudges from him. But these kids don't have that. What do they have? They have, here's the next two lines, gray-headed beetles. Now, it does sound like beetles, and I think that's on purpose, but that's like a a, a church official, basically. Gray-headed beetles walked before with wands as white as snow. So it's, it's kind of like these are they have these rods, but the, they're special rods. It has a magical element by calling it wands, but I think there's, especially at this time, the idea is that this is how they keep their authority with the children. Or like, how do they keep all those kids in line? Well, they got those rods, or we, we, you know, we're going to use a euphemism and call them wands, because like, oh, they somehow magically get all these orphans, you know, these ragamuffins to uh, march two and two. Well, how? Well, it's going to beat the crap out of you if you don't. Like, that's kind of what's underlying what's going on here, right? Gray-headed beetles walked before. So they have these guys walking before them or in front of them with wands as white as snow, right? Like, there's no, there's nothing wrong with those wands. Um, they're, they're very beautiful and they go with the procession, but we also know what they're for. Right? We know what a, that wand or what that rod is for. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Right? We know what that's for. And it's as white as snow. So it, it kind of has the innocent look. But again, we get the sense that it's kind of a show, not reality. Till into the high dome of Paul's, they like Thames waters flow. Now, so this first stanza we have an overall comparison of this procession of children that's very cadence and march-like in the the sound, the form, and even the visual look of the words on the page that goes, you know, very similar. It's compared to the Thames River. Now, the Thames River flows through the heart of London. So there's a comparison here of these children and the heart of London. And so, you know, that's, we get this clear, like, oh, look at this beautiful, th-. like on the surface level, we get this view that, oh, look at this wonderful thing. It was on a Holy Thursday, their innocent face is clean. The children walked, walking two and two in red and blue and green. Gray-headed beetles walked before with wands as white as snow. To lend to the high dome of Paul's, they like Thames waters flow. I was like, oh, how pretty, right? But there's, when you get to the end of it, when you kind of get the totality as we're going, as we're going through this, you can also read that completely di- different. Twas on a holy Thursday, their innocent faces clean. The children walking two and two in red and blue and green. Gray-headed, gray-headed beetles walked before with wands as white as snow. Till into the high dome of Paul's they like Thames rotters flow. Now the next stanza. And the next stanza, you know, so in that first one, we got the, the major metaphor of the Thames w- River and these children walking through it. And, uh, you know, they are the heart of it. And I, I think also you kind of, um, you know, could sum that first stanza up as the children are carried away by their innocent faith, their innocent faith, right? They're not rebelling, they're, although there are the rods, but there is a kind of faith in the system that they are having, um, you know, that will take care of them. And that's something that 
is true of children and they're kind of carried away just like you know the waters of the thames carry things away now the metaphor changes in the second stanza now so let me let me read this actually oh what a multitude they seemed these flowers of london town so note the flowers that that's the new metaphor seated in companies they sit with radiance all their own the hum of multitudes was there but multitudes of lambs thousands of little boys and girls raising their innocent hands. So now we have flowers, and the flower analogy or or, um, metaphor, the comparison, emphasizes beauty and fragility. The children are not, we learn, the refuse of the city. Although that's one way you could look at these orphans. It's like, these are the leftovers. These are the kids nobody wants. They're the, you know, like just put them somewhere so no, we can't see them. And then once a year we bring them out and look, look how great we are. But now the metaphor has changed and we're getting this sense of the fragility, the beauty, the fairness of these children, that these children are to some degree the fairest, maybe even to, to some degree the best and it, uh, of the city's you know, um, whole system. And of course, if you know the Christian ethos, that's of course very much in line with the Christian ethos, this idea that the meek shall inherit the earth and this this beautiful, innocent. And we get a comparison also between children and flowers and children and lambs. Now, as we've seen in other poems in the Songs of Innocence, like The Little Lamb, we have that comparison between like a little lamb and a little boy and how innocent and cute they are when they talk and, you know, Pay, go listen to that um, episode of mine if you want to see the broader context of what he's talking about and why that's important. And of course, we know that there's such a thing as, um, or we know that there's a comparison of Jesus in the Bible to a lamb and his innocence and that he was a sacrificial lamb for the rest of us. And there is that kind of feeling here is like, well, in order for our society to exist, we seem to be able, we seem to have to have um this kind of dirty part of it, that there's this, you know, these destitute children that are just kind of eh, left to the side, right? They didn't choose to be here, right? They were, they were born, right? They didn't choose to be born. Someone made the choice for them. And now they're in this situation that they have no options about. They didn't choose, they didn't do anything to, to, to deserve that, right? To deserve to be in poverty, to be dirty all the time. And then to be, you know, beaten or, or we assume some kind of physical force is compelled against them if they don't, you know, walk in this procession for the benefit of the rest of society to make everybody else feel better. So, oh, what a multitude so they seemed, these flowers of London, right? These, they're the flowers of London, the best of London, right? The fairest, the finest, the most beautiful. Seated in companies, they sit with radiance all their own, now notice the, the connotation denotation here. The hum of multitudes was there. So we, you get the sense of the hum of multitudes, which is not a necessarily a pretty sight. It doesn't feel pretty to have that kind of hum of multitudes. If it can feel overwhelming or almost like you know, creatures that would do a kind of hum of multitudes. But he quickly says, but multitudes of lambs. Now that changes it because again. Now we're thinking, oh, well, this is much sweeter. It's like, bah, bah, you know, like that kind of cute little sound in the background. And what is it that we're talking about? We're talking about thousands of little boys and girls raising their innocent hands. So in the second stanza, we have a comparison between lambs and flowers and the children. Not only physical uh, appearance, but also their voices, the hum. A hum is, you know, you can hum, it's a sound. So that's what they sound like. And then the last stanza, we're going to get a um, closer understanding of their, or a closer examination of what their voice is capable of. Here's the last stanza. Now, like a mighty wind, they raise to heaven the voice of song, or like harmonious thunderings, the seats of heaven among beneath them sit the aged men, wise guardians of the poor. Then cherish pity, lest you drive an angel from your door. So in the last stanza, we get this idea of their voice. It's not just a hum of lambs, but now that they've entered the cathedral 
and they are singing, they their voice has a power to it. It's a mighty wind. Well, you can think of the mighty winds of change. And they have a connection to heaven that the rest of us don't. They're closer to heaven, they're more godlike, and raised to heaven the voice of song. And then there's a harmonious thundering, right? So th- their voices come together. And, you know, if you ever heard s- children sing, it's probably not the most beautiful thing, like a professional, uh, you know, orchestra or anything like that. But And, and I think we, we can understand that. But we can also see that in this, you know, um, thousands of little boys and girls raising their, their voices, in this case, to the heavens, there is a kind of, he's making an analogy to this God, or I should say a metaphor to this God-like experience um, or this God-like lifting of their voices that kind of transcends everything around them and all the, the dirty, destitute nature of what's going on and rises to heaven. And then where have the, remember these gray-headed beetles walked in front of them, before them with wall? Where are they now? Beneath them set, sit the aged men, wise guardians of the poor. So now that these children are singing, and we see them raising their innocent hands and singing you know, to, to the glory of God, and we know that God has a special place in his heart, Jesus has a special place in his heart for the meek, for children, for innocence, and these children represent that. So they are at the highest levels of society in, in this poem, and that's what he's saying. And I think that is now pushing these old wise men who are in charge of everything beneath them. These guardians of the poor are now at the bottom. They're sitting at the feet of these kids and they're nothing. And so the last line is kind of a reminder, cherish pity lest you drive an angel from your door, right? Like, don't forget you're not, these kids aren't beneath you. You're beneath these kids. And it's important for you to recognize that. Otherwise, you're going to drive an angel from your door. And if you drive an angel from your door, you're going to go to hell. Right? This is not going to be a good thing in afterlife. And it's that kind of reminder. Now, whatever you believe of William Blake's philosophy and his religion, I mean, you know, I've said this before, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist, but there's definitely something about the idea that these kids are going through this process, that they're they're abandoned in this sense. And um you know, we need to recognize it and the society needs to recognize what's what's happening. Why why is that happening to them? What, what are we doing wrong? You know, sh- Christian charity, should we give all of our money? Should it be taken from us from the government? You know, um, or are there other situations, other institutions, other taboos, mores, views, worldviews, actions that we are taking that's leading to that? Right, he's going to have some more criticism that pops up, but I want to point out how, like, again, if you read this poem, just on the surface level, it doesn't feel like an indictment of the Holy Thursday practice. But when you think about what the Holy Thursday practice was, that it was like this kind of institutionalized marching of these children, you know, again, for what purpose? You know, to to make the viewers feel better. Like, oh, this is where my money's going. So it's like a marketing thing. But the question is always, well, is those, are those kids really in the best that they could be? Like, what more could we do for them? Is this really for them or if it, is it for us, right? And, um, you know, if it's for us, why is it for us? Like, what, what does that mean about us? And um, especially if you're kind of using these kids and cleaning them up just for this show and not beating them because you have a white wand rather than a you know darker one that maybe has blood on it or something. And and that you're just kind of forcing them through this. You force them to sing. And then when they do sing, you know, they put you in your place and uh, remind you that you're nothing and they're everything. And that this is a kind of almost a veiled critique of Holy Thursday, the practice of doing this. Now, several years later, a couple, only a couple years later, William Blake wrote Holy Thursday the, um, in the Songs of Experience. And I want to read this to you, and maybe when we do the Songs of Experience, we'll, we'll go into this deeper. But I just want you to get a sense for 
the difference. And you could see in the Songs of Innocence where it's like, oh, this cute little innocent practice of these cute little innocent kids walking through this uh, town. But then there's kind of this darkness to it when you really look at it. It's like, wait, why are we? Why are these kids in this situation in the first place? Right? Like, what world have we built that this is allowed or this is the norm? Now, in the Songs of Experience, the kind of contrast or the the antithesis that you could say is going to be way, way darker. And you're going to see this as dark, I think, when you when you read it. So is here's the poem, Holy Thursday by William Blake's Songs of Experience. Is this a holy thing to see in a rich and fruitful land? Babes reduced to misery, fed with cold and usurous hand. Is that a trembling cry, a song? Can't it be a song of joy? And so many children poor. It is a land of poverty. And their sun does never shine. And their fields are bleak and bare. And their ways are filled with thorns. It is eternal winter there. For where'er the sun does shine, and where the rain does fall, babe can never hunger there, nor poverty the mind appall. So if we look again at the, uh, the the surface level is much more, I think what he's expressing here, there's not as many levels or or layers that you could see this. It's just an indictment of this. He's asking the question, wait, is this a holy thing? You know, Holy Thursday is, is we're in this rich and fruitful land. And yet we have these babies, these children, these innocents who, again, they've made no choice to be here. They are here because of the choices of their parents. And the, their parents are here because of the choices of society to get together and have this society. right? So why are these babes, these innocents, reduced to misery, fed with cold and usurious hand? You know, usury is, is money lending, so he doesn't have a very favorable you know, feel of that. And, um, but there is a sense, you know, I'm very pro money lending. I'm very pro finance and all those things, but there is a sense where it's like, there's definitely, you know, I've never been an orphan. I've not even really known very many orphans. Um, there is, a, but we can all, I think, get a sense that it's definitely different to, you know, as a baby, have your mother feed you versus have some, uh, you know, be, be in a line of 20, 40, 100, 200 children and, you know, kind of being fed all over twist style where you just get whatever you can and nobody really cares about you. Right. And that's like, that's a pretty sad thing. And, you know, to live in a land that's seemingly wealthy as London is at this time, it's getting, gaining wealth, especially, but it's, you know, in the, the scheme of the world at this time, it's pretty wealthy. And to see that is pretty difficult for him for the, the author. And then he asks, is that a, tre- is that trembling cry a song? So the, the song that we heard in the Holy Thursday from songs of innocence, the, the hum of multitude, the, the whole song singing just this, uh, <clears throat> you know, during the, the Ascension day during Holy Thursday, that's part of what the, they do is children sing is, but that it sounds to him like a trembling cry. Like they're crying and they want help and they want people to take care of them and no one's taking care of them. No one's loving them. There's no one to to take them aside and hug them and to play with them and tell them that everything's going to be okay when they get hurt and things like that. It's a trembling cry of, uh, it's not a song. It's a trembling cry. It's like, you know, the, what's going on inside of them. Can it be a song of joy and so many children poor, right? So those are rhetorical questions where I think the answer is pretty obvious can it be a song of joy? Not really. And so many children with, you know, because the next question is with so many children poor, right? Like, can this be joyful with all these kids poor? Like that's kind of how I'm reading that. It's a land of poverty. So this rich land, right? In a rich and fruitful land in the second line of first stanza. But in the fourth line, he said, no, but it's actually a land of poverty. Cause if we have, you know, all this rich and fruitfulness, then why are these kids like this? So we must be poverty. We must still be a pov- impoverished land land which by the way 1794 compared to 2020 is like yes it is an impoverished land and it's like a third world country compared to us now but he didn't he can't know that he is living in the wealthiest country on the planet basically in in all of human history to some degree 
Now he goes on, uh, and their sun does never shine, and their fields are bleak and bare. Right, That's their life, and their ways are filled with thorns. Even if it's just metaphorical thorns, just the hardship of their life is just every day. And read some of the Songs of Innocence that we saw already, and you'll see more in Songs of Experience, but the little black boy, the chimney sweeper, they're doing these, these hard and horrible things, and you know they have no one to care for them. It is, it is eternal winter there. For wherever the sun does shine and wherever the rain does fall, babe can never hunger there nor poverty the mind appall. So in this place where shine, where you know the sun shines, the rain falls. You know you could not a thunderstorm kind of a rain, but a, a beautiful like uh, springtime rain that's nice to kind of you know walk around and 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 spin and dance in the rain type thing. Like that's how I think he's saying that. In that perfect land, babes can never go hungry. Poverty, you know, of the mind can will appall. Like we would do something about it if we lived in that land, but we don't live in that land. That's not the land um, that that we have. And um, by the way, if you want to, the another good poem that might help you with the the idea of that land that I'm talking about is um, the laughing song in songs of innocence, which I've done an episode on. And I think the divine image is another one that comes right before this, that helps with that song with understanding that idea. And I want to give you a movie recommendation to end this off with that. I think will actually help you understand this poem more um, and because it's modern and it, you know, it's easy to go see this is uh, a movie that came out. It was just nominated for several Oscars. I'm recording this, um, Man, when is this? February 15th, 2020. So, um, you know, you might be, I plan on having this up for as long as the internet's up. So I don't know when you'll see this, but um, it was just the Oscars and a great movie that I really enjoyed was Jojo Rabbit. And in Jojo Rabbit, you get a young little, uh, a 10 year old Nazi boy. And you can't sympathize with Nazis but you can sympathize with the 10 year old Nazi boy because one, there's no such thing as a 10 year old Nazi. There's, um, you know, children of Nazis. So in this case, the children, you know, he's a Nazi youth. He's indoctrinated and he's just a boy not knowing what to do in the same sense. I don't believe you can have, I don't believe there's actually any such thing as, um, and I, I mean, like, I don't believe they exist. Like they're gremlins. It's not a real thing. They're ghosts. There's literally, non-existent Christian children or Muslim children or uh, atheist children or, or, or any, you know, uh, anti-vaxxer children or transgender children. I don't think those are actual entities. I think what they are, are the children of Christians, the children of atheists, the children of Muslims and so on, because children are too young to have those kind of ideological conclusions themselves. They can only be mouthpieces for the adults around them. And that I think is what's interesting about Jojo Rabbit. And I think what's what's in Holy Thursday to some degree, I mean, it's not clear in there, but the children, are, you know, it's not exactly a, a parallel is what I should say, except in the emphasis on innocence and how we view innocence. So we're able to see Jojo Rabbit because of his innocence. And we, we look at the innocence and we see, you know, this innocent boy going through these actions of a boy. And um, there's a line in the movie when one of the older men, who's a, a, a disenchanted Nazi. So this is the very last days of the war. They're, they're losing the war. It's clear that they're losing the war. It's a, and, um, you know, I'll just say that the, the war ends within the structure of the movie, actually. And um, so, you know, you have this disenchanted um, Nazi. And, you know, he says to uh, Jojo Rabbit, yeah, I had a young little imaginary friend when I was a, a friend or a boy too. The difference is that because of when Jojo Rabbit, the main character, the 10 year old boy was born, which he, he must've been born in 1935 because of when he was born, you know, so he's born in Hitler's reign. Hitler is his imaginary friend. Now it's a very, it's a satire. It's making fun of the Nazis. Of course, it's making fun of that whole world, but it's, you know, very important, I think, to um, 
understand that kind of indoctrination. And you get that in the songs of innocence and experience and these, all the poems, I think, taken together. In Holy Thursday, you don't see it as clearly, but you kind of do. Like, you know, there's a scene where, in Jojo Rabbit, where they go to a, a Nazi youth camp for the weekend. And um, they're all sitting there. All these little boys are sitting there and, and little girls too. And then the two, you know, Nazi leaders, the the elders tell, you know, tell them we're going to do this, we're going to do that. You know, who wants to go do this? You know, and, and what they're talking about is like blowing up stuff, stabbing stuff, you know, killing people. Like it's all these horrible things uh, done in, again, a kind of satirical weird, like way to kind of point out how ludicrous it is to teach this to children. And there's just this scene where they're talking to the kids and they ask the kids something and the kids all raise their hand. And, you know, it reminded me of the on Holy Thursday, the the scene where, um, you know, thousands of little boys and girls raising their innocent hands. They're, they're doing what the um, elders are telling them because the elders are telling them. They're not doing it because they've chosen or because they understand it. They're just brainwashed into doing it. I think in Holy Thursday, you get something similar where they're, you know, living that world out in the little black boy by um, William Wordsworth or William Blake. There's something similar where the little black boy is told a story by his mother about why he is black, why he and she are black in this white land. They're slaves, by the way. And the reason she tells him is because, you know, God puts out this um, heat of that's his love and heat burns. And because, you know, they're black because they're, they're closer to the, the um, heat of God and the love of God. And they're more capable, therefore, of withstanding that heat. And therefore, they you know, are like the cloud that shields the white folk around them. And so that's kind of what their duty is. And the little black boy takes that to heart and tells it to a little English boy. And th- I think the point, though, is that you should walk away from that and think, well, why did she tell that story? Why didn't she tell him the story of, you know, how to break free of your bonds and to kill the the white man, right? Like that's what you should be saying in that sense because they've enslaved you and they don't have a right to do that, right? And you know, so in that in that sense, you know, if you're literal slaves like that, you do have that that right to to kind of to kill your masters, to get away, um, have every right to do that. And she doesn't tell that story. She tells the story that placates him, that makes him feel better, that kind of keeps the system going. And you get that in Holy Thursday where it's like we have this system that you know parades these children around like, oh, yay, we're so great for giving them a couple dollars you know, uh, every year. But really they're impoverished and they're, they're living in this system that's telling them that everything's okay when everything's not okay. And they're told to raise their hands and to walk in line and they clean their faces. And these kids don't care. And you see this, you know, they just want to be, or they just need to be loved and to be cared for. And they're not getting that. They're in this system that's not getting them. Similarly, Jojo Rabbit is in this system that's ultimately betraying him as a little boy. And it's destroying him as a little boy. And, you know, the um, conflict and why I think the movie is so great is that his mother is actually a good person who's pretending and she's playing a game in order to survive because you can't tell the truth in this world. And so she has to pretend to be, um, you know, a good little Nazi wife or woman. And her husband is off fighting, although he is said to have been abandoned and had to have um, gone AWOL because he was a coward. That's what they call him. And um, Jojo Rabbit, therefore, is also a coward. And they call him Jojo Rabbit because he's unwilling to break a rabbit's neck. Right? Again, this is an innocent rabbit's one of the most innocent animals you can think of. And Jojo Rabbit is incapable of doing it because he's just too innocent to do it. And he's equated to it. So he's also a rabbit. <clears throat> and But this mother is trying to play this game where she's living with a 10-year-old Nazi. And she is an anti-Nazi. But she can't say anything. She can't discipline him. She has to hide the fact that she's hiding a Jewish woman in her house from the little boy because she knows that her little boy has been indoctrinated so much that he's so enamored in this the system. You know, again, he's like the little black boy a little bit grown up where he's, he believes this lie so much that he might tell 
and then get them all killed. And so she has to play this game where she has to be careful of what she says around him. And she has to kind of play to him. And yet the battle is a battle to try to keep the joyous innocence, the beauty that's within this little boy, that he's still just a little boy who doesn't understand what's going on. And, you know, to keep that alive as much as possible. I think that's why the poem, the, the movie is so beautiful and, um, and it's shot beautifully and acted well. And so I think, you know, that, that all kind of adds to it. And I think if you read these poems, the songs of innocence, you see how William Blake is trying to use these innocence to, to affect change in a certain way. He's not didactic about it. He's not in your face. He's trying to show you like <clears throat> with this poem, like, okay, look at this beautiful procession that you've probably been to the Holy Thursday, the Ascension day. You probably felt good about it. Have you ever thought about these little elements that are you know kind of behind the scenes? And he's not going to say that, but he's going to kind of make you feel it with the words, the rhythm, the rhyme, and the you know the denotation, the key, you know the connotation, all the elements of language to kind of make up this song. And then, in context to this po- this overall book, that kind of asks this very difficult question. And then in seventeen ninety four, he's much more in your face about it with. Uh, you know, with what what he's saying in terms of the harshness of the reality. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you really go. I really, really hope you go see Jojo Rabbit. I think it's worth seeing. Um, and I think it'll help you understand how innocence could be used to play up or to help adults in this case, understand the system that they're in and how r- weird, ludicrous or wrong it might be. You know, you have these innocents playing a game, in this case of Jojo Rabbit, that represents the larger, more ludicrous game of the war that's being played out based on these ludicrous people, these Nazis, who are all ridiculous. Their norms are ridiculous. Everything they believe is ridiculous. And it's important, I think, that we see that. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed uh, Holy Thursday by William Blake, and I'll see you next time.